Thank you so much for being here this evening. Somewhere in the audience is my daughter. She's a freshman at Dartmouth, D21, so it's, it's, uh, this is a rare occasion for me. I don't think it'll ever, ha ever happen again, so it's kind of nice to be here. Um, really excited to be here with you and talk about my passion and my research. It's on data analytics and predictive modeling. For the past six to 10 years, we've been talking about the big data revolution. What I want to emphasize is that going forward, it's not about big data revolution, but it's about better data and better models revolution. It's a combination of art and science. The science comes from statistics, optimization, marketing, and economic theory. And the art comes from managerial knowledge, domain expertise, and creativity. You might wonder, why did I receive this email? Oh, nice tie and suit, but uh, <laughs> when I'm reading CNN.com, why did I see this banner ad for a dual fuel cooking range? Predictive analytics begins with some data. You start with some data, and we're trying to estimate something. We're trying to estimate, let's say, for example, how sensitive people are to prices. And then using that, we're trying to then figure out what is a sweet spot for prices. Many packaged goods firms, retailers, banks, Netflix, Amazon, you know, they use this framework. And they use it for product recommendations. And they use a technique called Bayesian inferencing. What happens is, you know, you observe this, like, let's say, million page width. You compute the posterior probability of observing a competing product conditional on the fact that you have you've viewed, let's say, the Electrolux brand. And then you recommend those products that have the highest posterior probabilities. The banner ad that I showed you before, there's a story behind it. You know, recently we have renovated our entire downstairs area in our home, broken down many walls, gutted the kitchen. And in that context, we actually saw this monstrous dual fuel cooking range and oven on amazon.com. And believe it or not, we actually ordered it from there. And within two days, it was in, a, in front of our front door. And I tell you that $99 Amazon Prime, totally worth it. <laughs> and, and that's how we saw that. So now when you look at all this data, we have so much of this data being thrown at us at an even faster volume. You know, we have blogs and tweets, loyalty program data, transaction level data. And you won't believe it, there is actually eye tracking data in retail stores. Seems futuristic, but it's happening right now. So when I talk to managers, they tell me, Praveen, you know, we have so much data, but we don't know what to do with it. And my friends, that's what I'm gonna talk about now. So if you look at this data from a 20,000 feet level, we're not gonna learn much. Everything looks like flat. If you really want to understand the beauty of the data, you have to dig deeper to get the consumer insights from that data. So let me first tell you, you know, the idea is to make sense of the data. What is not meaningful is to either look at the data at a very granular level or at computing many, many different correlations that might lead to apophenia, where you sense patterns when none exist. This is a cool one that I found on Pinterest, which amazingly, this pizza looks exactly like a brain scan of someone who is experiencing apophenia, right? I would say what is more meaningful is to aggregate the data at the minimum level necessary to do so and no more. And the second is I close my eyes and I visualize the data as a flat file 
where I have the rows as the observations and the columns as the variables. And then when you have tens of millions of observations, leverage the power of random sampling. Trust me, the central limit theorem always works. And then start with some theory and run some experiments. You know, predictive analytics reminds me of this great quote from Pele, the soccer player. What gives me an edge is that others go to where the ball is, whereas I go to where the ball is going to go. What I want to point out here is, one, describe what better data means. Second, how managerial intuition and statistical tools can lead to smart data compression, i.e., you know, think about what columns to look at and why data mining and machine learning, despite their obvious value, will not obviate the need for marketing and economic theory, i.e., which will tell us where to look for in the data and how better data can feed into predictive models and how managers can use these models in their decision making. So your predictive models are going to be that much more powerful if they are based on better data. And you might ask what that means. And what I mean by that is there is exogenous variation in the variables that you can control. As opposed to big data, there's lots of it, but there is no variation in the variables of interest, leave alone exogenous or not. So for example, if you are interested in trying to figure out the best way to change consumer behavior, I would say run some field experiments. Or if you're trying to predict sales, combine your sales and marketing data with secondary data over time. And if you want to estimate how sensitive consumers are to prices, right, you can use scanner panel data, which by the way, if you go to co-op in Hanover and you buy something, they ring it, that stuff is being recorded in some central data place. That's the scanner panel data. If you're trying to enhance customer loyalty, I would say use loyalty card data, which is when you go to CVS in Hanover and give your, give your extra care card, that's the loyalty program data. If you want to make optimal marketing decisions like pricing and advertising, you can use slow store level scanner data combined with competitor data. So the point I'm trying to make is that you know, each of these objectives have different data sources that you, can, that you can rely on. So in the next few minutes, what I want to do is go over two case studies that I've been involved in. And the first one is predicting sales at a multi-billion dollar business to business company, which means this business is selling stuff to another business as opposed to consumers. And the other one is developing and implementing a price optimization algorithm at a, at a retail chain. In this project, I remember I was sitting around a conference table surrounded by eight vice presidents of the company, all of whom were engineers. I'm an engineer by training myself. And I remember asking them, how do I add value here? And they said to me, look, you know, we collected all this data and we hit a roadblock. We're not able to figure out what's the best way going forward to predict what are sales going to be in the future, and that's where we need your help. I said, huh, let's, I said, let's plot the data. So we plotted the data. That's how it looks like. So the blue line is what we're trying to predict, and here are all the other variables. So I figured what I want to do, there's so many, you know, 100 plus factors. Somehow I need to, remember the data compression I talked about? I need to reduce that. So I said, I need to come up with some weighted indices and how do I do that? And there's a statistical technique called factor analysis, which is a data compression technique, which helps me derive what those weights need to be across these variables. So that was my first step. Okay, I want to reduce the confusion here and create these weights and come up with these 
what is known as factor scores. Then I got the weights, then I used the regression analysis that most of you are familiar with, where I then regressed my sales onto these factor scores. And I used the results of that regression analysis for predicting sales. Does that make sense? And this is how the results look like. So you see the green vertical bar. So I use the data on the left side of the bar to estimate my regression model. So the black line shows the predictions. The orange line shows the actual values of the sales change. So the values on the left side of the green bar gives me the in-sample fit because that's the data I used to train my model. And the data on the right-hand side of the green bar shows the out-of-sample fit. I looked at this guy and said, man, it's quite impressive. I was not just, I was quite impressed. So were the eight engineers that I was able to go from this graph to this graph. My second case study is from a large retail national chain where we are trying not just to predict sales, but to develop and implement a price optimization algorithm in a business to consumer context because they're selling directly to consumers. So we had huge amount of data. Think about it's 100 stores, daily transactions, million consumers, 180 categories, 10,000 stock keeping units. Stock keeping units are 100 count of nature made vitamin C tablets in gel form is an SKU. If that thing, the same thing is happened to be in like a tablet form, it's a different SKU. That's what we're talking about here. One million customers, two year free rate. Talk about big data, it's a lot of data. So we analyzed, you know, 14 categories, about almost 800 SKUs. And yes, we had a lot of disaggregate data, but what for what we were trying to do, we don't need to analyze at that granular level. So we aggregated the data at the store level and at the week level, at the SKU level. Right? That means we're looking at, so observation are, what are the sales of this particular SKU in this particular week in that particular store. That's good enough. We don't need to look at how Praveen bought this particular SKU in this week, right? Because it's not relevant in, in that sense. So look at, you know, when you look at the third column, we were able to optimize only 65% of the SKUs. It's not that we didn't have data on the other 35% of the SKUs. We had big data on the other 35% of the SKUs. But the reason we were not able to optimize that is because in that big data, it was useless data. The reason it was useless because there was no variation in the prices of those 35% SKUs in the two year period. Which means that if I'm standing like this, if I have never moved, and you ask me the question, what would happen to me if I, never, if I, if I move? I cannot answer the question because I've never moved. So I told the CEO, please, move these prices, make some changes over a few weeks, and then I can answer the question, what will happen to the sales of these products if you change the prices? So that's, and, and, and that was our frame. And then the algorithm that we used, as I said, we began with our sales data, our marketing variables, prices, and so on, and we were able to get competitors' data as well, and we combine the two to estimate what we call a demand model, which comes from managerial experience and marketing and economic theory in terms of what are the drivers of demand. We are estimating the various sensitivities in that, in that function. And the output of that gets fed into a optimization module. We are trying to optimize or figure out the sweet spot for the prices for each of these SKUs. But that needs to have some inputs itself. So it's got three different inputs. One is the strategic framework of how your competitor is going to react if you change your prices. Second and equally important, what's your goal? What are you trying to maximize? Is it profitability? Is it market share? So in this case, it was profitability. 
And then what are the heuristics? For example, in this retail chain, all the six packs of Coke are priced in the same way. And the prices end in nine. So those become constraints in that model, in the optimization model. So you run that for each of these SKU, and then out comes your optimal prices and the marketing decisions, and they get approved by the manager, and then they get executed in the marketplace. Once you get executed, we get that data back, and once we get that data back, then our data gets updated. So our demand model is re-estimated, our optimization is re-optimized, and we do this week after week for 12 weeks. So we ran a randomized field experiment where we assigned 21 stores as test stores and 21 as control, where in the test stores, we have implemented this optimization algorithm. And in the control stores, it was business as usual, where the store manager determines the prices. In a sense, again, in this 780 SKUs. So here are the results. The key performance metric we kept track of is a gross margin dollars, which is price minus cost of goods sold. So relative to control, there was a statistically significant improvement of about 40.7 cents per SKU per week per store. Is this a managerially significant number? So let's extrapolate it to the enterprise level. So take 40.7 cents, 10,000 SKUs, and assuming that 74% of the SKUs is where we can uh, realize the margin, that's about $3,000 margin improvement per week per store. And you have 52 weeks, assuming that in 50% of the week that we get that improvement, that, re that translates to about $78,000 margin improvement per store per year, and multiplied by Number of stores, 100, that's $7.8 million expected margin improvement per, per year with a 99% confidence interval of $4.7 million and $10.9 million. And to this day, that company still implements their price optimization algorithm. So my friends, the bottom line is better and not necessarily big data-based predictive analytic systems improve the bottom line in retail. Namaste.